A little hanging stained glass window bearing a wise saying from my godchild was my order. The statue of Street Francis of Assisi arrived in perfect white condition. Because I was confused, I contacted the vendor to get an explanation. The item they sent me had nothing to do with my item or order number, which caused them confusion. They sent the window hanging and told me to keep the lucky statuette. They were admit that I should get in touch with Street Francis because some higher power was at work. This unexpected gift and turn of events were accepted by me, so I said okay. I made sure to clear a space around my beloved living room chair and often thought about this present. Francis, what brings you to this place? What am I supposed to study or do? Have you something to tell me? Do with the unpredictability of Ohio's weather, which can be either warm and windy or cold and freezing. The date must be late March or early April. I had to get out my bulky wool coat on the morning of the event due to the precipitous decrease in temperature. I went to work in my winter coat and dress with T-strapped heels. A Ford cargo van in yellow with tinted windows was mine to purchase. The engine was a potent Canadian V8, and it was automated. Acclimating to the unique blind spots and side mirrors of such a large vehicle required some practice. It was a terrifying change since I was driving a Ford Pinto. Masonry barriers between tenant parking spaces allowed this small vehicle to fit into a fourplex garage. We were roommates on the inside, but our garage doors were different. At the far end of the garage, between the brick wall on the right and the brick separator on the left, I parked. About a quarter of the way out of the garage this morning, I discovered my angle was off as I was backing out of the garage this morning. I parked the van, opened the door, and sprang out since I didn't want to damage the paint. I went around to the rear of the vehicle to assess whether I should straighten it out. As I went back to the driver's side door to unlock it and climb inside, the van suddenly changed gears and was speeding toward the garage. I leaped into the van as fast as I could, but the door was closing too quickly. With my heart racing from the near-death experience of my legs being severed by the slamming door as it collided with the brick separator, I ducked away from it. To calm down, I clumsily rested my head against the van. Then it hit me. The van was pulling me into the narrow gap between the brick barrier and the vehicle. I made an effort to free myself, but I was already too entangled, and nothing was working. I cried out for assistance. From that point on, I felt the relentless pressure of a series of increasingly intense movements. Agony and pain turned my cries into a sound. My acceptance of the reality of having suffered traumatic brain injury, fractured bones, and who knows what else came quickly. When God first rendered me unconscious, I was angry with him because I felt he did not love me enough. I preferred to avoid having to think about this. After that, I started to worry that my body was going to stop working. In addition to vomiting, I emptied my bladder and bowels. The end was near. My state of mind shifted from being furious at my dad, life, and myself to being spiritually resolved to channel this anger in a healthy way. My love blossomed, and I was able to forgive in its emergence. After that, it hit me. I'm familiar with this drill. I've executed it countless times. I left the body via that tender region, the same one seen in a baby's skull. I felt liberated, joyful, and content. Being liberated from the shackles of a material body, gravity, and form was a liberating experience for me. It was as if someone had taken off a tightly fitting girdle, a sigh of relief. After that, I shifted my focus to the ground below. The elderly neighbor was gasping for air. My broken corpse lay wedged between the brick partition and the van. Additionally, I noticed that individuals from all throughout the area had gathered. My focus shifted to my loved ones and the effect my passing will have on them. Their imminent horror, remorse, and misery were palpable to me. After that, I looked up and saw Kumi, whose real name is Street Francis of Assisi. In his everlasting presence, Jesus appeared as a humanoid light vignette surrounded by cherubs. He was someone I looked up to as a guide and instructor. In space, neither time nor words exist in the same way that they do in our three-dimensional reality. Countless pieces of information and conversations were freely given with me, and there was zero room for misunderstanding or miscommunication. The confluence of light and love is an incredibly lovely phenomenon. Because it is what it is, I can only provide a summary of this conversation. In fact, 
It changes slightly every time I recount it. My Christo spirit presence was calling me back to examine a critical circumstance that was getting in the way of my life's journey. Things had to be reorganized and put back on track for me. Consequently, this demise constituted a recall of the safety valve. The slipping reversal was neither soul-required nor karmically induced, but I had to bring my conscious mind to the realization nevertheless. In order to decide whether I wanted this to continue or finish, I required the higher guidance. I realized this road was leading me somewhere else than where I needed to go. I had to accept the fact that the road I had not intended to take was being paid for me by my own choices. My alcoholism was an issue that I needed to address. In my own life, I was drinking myself to unconsciousness on multiple occasions. Despite my confidence, I couldn't maintain control. I had to find a way to stop drinking or else I would become numb. This was absolutely essential, and I understood why. I was completely in agreement. There was an option for me to either go back to my existing existence and rejoin my body, which would put me back into the scene below, or I could be born to a new family right away and start anew. I made the unthinkable decision to undergo a miraculous recovery free of shattered bones and ruptured organs caused by the compressive force of the collision. Medical professionals were perplexed and unconcerned about the reality of what occurred to me in terms of present and self-awareness, despite the fact that I had physical body memory and muscle displacement. I found the thought of beginning afresh with parents who were seeking truth through mainstream religions and similar beliefs to be unappealing. Light and love do not contain the qualities of being haughty, judgmental, conceited, or exceptional, so I pray this does not come off that way. The fact that we are immortal beings of divine origin is irrelevant to my choice to return. Since I would have to return to speculating, hoping, wondering, and despairing if I didn't have this rare opportunity to know for sure, I'm being completely forthright in sharing my thoughts and feelings about it. If I had gone with the second birth option, my future parents would have no choice but to impart their religious views to me. As a child, I would be bound to what would effectively be a repeat performance of the blind guiding the blind. I won't have to start from scratch because of my decision. Being fully aware of my identity as a spirit inhabiting a human body is a blessing bestowed upon me. As a spiritual compass, I have this incredible revelation. I would remember this experience, but I would not believe I was one with the Creator. Returning to my physical form was an instantaneous consequence of this choice. The vehicle lost control and collided with the rear wall. I was encircled by others who were removing me from the brick separator and supporting me. So that I could stand, they were trying to remove my shoes. A medical rescue vehicle was en route. I was a stinky, torn up mess with a tattered inner coat and a bent steel shank in my shoes. This mysterious stranger was there when I got back to my physical form. He introduced himself as a neighbor from approximately four units below. Standing against the wall of the garage, he wore a hat that resembled a cap and appeared to be huddling with me. Do not resist, he evaluated the agreements I had made with Kumi and my decision, and he informed me that I would need to visit the hospital. I was taken aback, so I extended an invitation for tea to further explore this with him. I never saw him again, although he said something later on when I returned. As I was expressing my desire to get some sleep in my apartment, I mentioned some miraculous occurrences. The paramedics loaded me onto a stretcher and rushed me to the hospital, bracing themselves for the inevitable hemorrhage that was sure to ensue. That did not take place. Almost dead, I was the happiest person alive. At the hospital, the paramedic who was seated behind me made a proclamation. A battery of tests, including full-body x-rays, were conducted. I remained at the scene throughout the remainder of the day, with the paramedic making rounds to the hospital to see how I was doing. We had some thought-provoking conversations since he was astounded by how effectively I was processing the events. Ike, my overprotective neighbor, who we both thought was my dad, had finally let me go. The loss of so much fluid had left me feeling quite weak. With Ike's assistance, I stood up and walked out after drinking a glass of orange juice that I insisted on having delivered. 